All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome, welcome back to the channel. Thank you all so much for coming over. Now, we are on the Beat Goes On channel, all right, and they have a brief history of Radiohead. I'm checking this out because I've been thinking about doing a full album reaction to Radiohead. I remember when I made that uh, video about albums I should listen to. Um, Radiohead was up there but of course if I des decide to do it it won't be over here it'll be over on my Patreon all right but we're gonna check this out again shout out to all you guys that are going over on my second channel watching my movie reactions really trying to get that going all right so again appreciate all the love and support man <clears throat> let's check this out Radiohead who I just know the song Creep. I don't know too much of nothing <laughs> about the band. So, yeah, here we go. Let's jump right into it. Abington, Oxfordshire, England, 1985. Five young lads form a band while attending Abington School, widely regarded as one of the finest boys boarding schools in all of the United Kingdom. The five were guitarist and singer Tom York, bassist Colin Greenwood, multi-instrumentalist Johnny Greenwood, who was Colin's younger brother, guitarist Ed O'Brien, and drummer Phil Selway. So the Tom, five didn't really know each other that well when they formed the band. They named the band On a Friday, because that's the day they usually practiced in the Friday. school's music building. Bands like Joy Division, R.E.M., U2, and The Smiths influenced them. Most of their early oh. shows were at random parties around the Oxford area. Their first official concert was at a place called Jericho Tavern. Hardly any people showed up and their performance didn't impress anyone in the local music scene. And then, giving in a bit to pressure from their parents, the band members all went to college. Eventually, all of them but Johnny would graduate from university. While attending, they all knew they wanted to keep playing together, but while they were in college for nearly four years, on a Friday, didn't play a single show. However, they did find time during holiday breaks that's, to practice. That's actually not a bad name, if you think about it. It's really not. Because you know what goes down on a Friday. A lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff go down every day, but you know, Friday is that start, the start of the weekend. So, hey. In 1991, the band began performing in public again. By this time, bands like the Pixies were more of an influence on them. The at Pixies. their first official show since taking a break at the Hollybush in Osney, they played to an audience of just six people. Although, Dang. apparently those six people really like them. And <laughs> then, after circulating a demo tape around Oxford and getting several more gigs at the Jericho Tavern, they started to create a buzz. They got so much attention that they ended up signing a six-album deal with EMI, one of the largest record labels in the world. Shortly after signing, the band changed their name to Radiohead, a reference to a Talking Heads song, because I guess that sounded cooler than on a Friday. They released their All first right. EP entitled Drill in May 1992. It didn't really do that well, and so they got some new producers and headed back to the studio. There was one song in particular that they ended up recording in just one take. Legend has it, the band didn't even know they were being recorded during the take. They thought uh, they were just rehearsing. After they were done playing, the whole room burst into applause. The song, called Creep, yeah. didn't impress the band much. Because he didn't like how quiet the song was, Johnny tried to fix the song later by adding random blasts of guitar noises. That ended up being one of the best parts of the song. Wow. Eventually, the record label was really excited. So on the accident. They done. <laughs> That's crazy, man. How you that you that damn talented where you can just make a song on an accident, pretty much like like not make a song, but you know what I'm trying to say. Wow, 
excited about Creep and determined it would be Radiohead's lead single. During its initial release, though, it wasn't really that much of a success. BBC Radio 1 Dang. didn't play it because they found the song too depressing. So, although Radiohead toured the United Kingdom like crazy, it didn't help the song become a hit much. Lucky for them, Creep did become a hit in other countries like Israel, New Zealand, and the United States. By the time the band released their first full-length album, Pablo Honey, on February Pablo 22nd, Honey. 1993, it was becoming a worldwide hit. It especially did well in the United States, where Radiohead toured their butts off. The song seemed to fit well within a genre of music that recently went mainstream called alternative rock. Pablo Honey received moderate critical praise. So could you guys comment below? Is this the album that you guys wanted me to react to? Or, or yeah, use this video to, for, for some direction on which album I should react to and much commercial success. Due to the album's success, Radiohead toured for the rest of 1993 and into 1994 to support it. The extended length and grind of this tour almost caused the band to break up. In the end, Pablo Honey generated two additional hits, Anyone Can Play Guitar and Stop Whispering. Mm. Creep overshadowed all others, though, which is why the band later got sick and tired of playing the song live. By 1994, That sounds like Radiohead a song. Hey, you creep. Anyone can play the guitar. Stop whispering. <laughs> oh, that sounds crazy. If you read it all together. Which is why the band later got sick and tired of playing the song live. By 1994, Radiohead was actually sick and tired of all of their songs and began writing new material and testing it out live in places like Australia and Southeast Asia. The new material ended up forming the band's second full-length album, The Bends, the released Bends. on March 13th, 1995. This album was a bit more polished and complex than Pablo Honey, with more effects and the introduction of keyboards into the mix. Radiohead also toured heavily to support this one. While the album was less of a commercial success, it was definitely more of a critical success. And they did manage to score a couple of solid hits with Fake Plastic Trees and High and Dry. It was their third album, OK Computer, released on May 21st, 1997, that took Radiohead's success to the next level. OK Computer was both a commercial and critical success. Many, many music critics oh, called it this an album. instant classic. Today, most regarded as their best album and yeah. one of the greatest albums of all time. Yeah. It features the singles Paranoid Android, Karma Police, and No Surprises. But it was really always just an album to listen to all the way through. The band toured for a year to support the album. Also that year, Radiohead became one of the first bands in the world to have a website and then a bit of a break. Tom York later said that during this time, about 1998-ish, the band again came close to breaking up due to burnout. York Damn. himself suffered from depression and writer's block at the time. After the huge success of OK Computer, each band member had a different vision for Radiohead's future. Eventually, though, they were able to sort it all out and head back into the recording studio in 1999, recording off and on for the next 18 months. Radiohead released their highly anticipated fourth album, Kid A, on October 2nd, 2000. It was a dramatic change in direction for the band. With this one, the band ditched their more traditional rock sound for a minimalist, textured, electronic, and just way more experimental one. At first, many fans didn't know how to take this new direction, and early reviews of the album were mixed. Eventually, though, this album came to be hailed as one of their greatest and one of the greatest. Radiohead released no singles or music videos to promote Kid A. They barely talked to the media. Instead, they relied on their website to promote everything. On June 5th, 2001, Radiohead released their fifth album, Amnesiac which was really the leftovers Amnesiac. from the Kid A sessions. Strangely, the album didn't feel like Kid A leftovers to most people. It was another solid album, and while it was also heavily electronic and experimental, it still had a different feel to it. This one did have singles. Pyramid Song, I Might Be Wrong, and Knives Out. Uh, While critics often operation. said it wasn't as good as Kid A, they still generally praised Amnesiac. This time around, Radiohead did not tour nearly as much. When they did tour, they had to learn how to perform electronic music live for the first time. In 2002, they returned to the studio and recorded tons of new material in just two weeks, 
quite a bit shorter than 18 months, eh? Plus, this time the band was pretty relaxed recording, as opposed to the tense times during the Kid A and Amnesiac sessions. This new material ended up making of what would become their sixth album, Hail to the Thief released June 9, 2003. With this album, Radiohead combined the experimental and electronic elements of the past two albums with the alternative rock instrumentation of the previous albums. Okay, Hell to the Thief had computer. three singles. There, There, Go to Sleep, and 2 plus 2 equals 5. That's right. Radiohead's popularity caused them to transcend the laws of mathematics. I'm and with like, that, what? Radiohead's contract with EMI was over. After the band's tour in 2004, they went on a hiatus to spend time with family and work on <laughs> side projects. Johnny Greenwood worked on multiple soundtracks. Smile, York released a solo album called The Eraser, but the hiatus didn't last too long. In February 2005, they returned to the studio, this time without a record label. That ended up being the material for their seventh album, In Rainbows. But it took them a while to finish it. It was finally released on October 10th, 2007, but it wasn't released how bands normally did at the time, especially bands as big as Radiohead. They released it as a, quote, pay what you want download directly from their want. website. This decision shook up the music industry and created a big debate about the merits of just letting the audience decide whether or not to pay for your music. And you had no real idea of the consequences at all. You had no idea how it was going to work out because it was a brand new model, if you think about it. People hadn't really done this before, certainly not on your level. So it was an exciting thing saying, let's throw it out there and see what happens. Oh, it was certainly exciting. It was, um, yeah, because uh, there was a, a few, few meetings that we, you know, sitting It's down always crazy to me when you hear just people talk record, versus how uh, they sing. Had it in a box, um, wanted to put it up and just, yeah, free of all the mechanics, all the drudgery of the whole thing. Although many downloaded the album for free, Radiohead still ended up making plenty of money from it. Yeah. XL Recordings later released a physical version of it. In Rainbows was arguably the most critically acclaimed Radiohead album since Kid A, with hits like Nude, Body Snatchers, Jigsaw Falling Into Place, and All I Need. In 2008, EMI released a greatest hits album without Radiohead's opinion on the matter. By this time, social media was big, and the band found themselves touring less and slowly withdrawing their media presence. In 2009, York started a new band to perform his songs live called Adams for Peace, featuring longtime producer Nigel Godrich and Red Hot Chili Peppers bassist Flea. In 2010, Radiohead played one official concert all year. That same year, Philip Selway released a solo album. Meanwhile, the band had off and on been recording what would become their eighth album, The King of Limbs. They self-released the it on limbs. February 18th, 2011 in digital format. This one featured much more sampling and loops than previous releases. The band again decided not to release any singles from the album, but Lotus Flower ended up becoming a hit oh, no, mostly due play to music? this music video in which Tom dances... Well, I guess you can see how he is dancing here. This video caused a viral dancing Tom. I don't know. Like, again, when they start to show footage or videos and if they play music, I probably have to either edit this out or put something over it so my video don't get blocked. York meme in which fans manipulated the audio or video from it in creative ways. Nope. They're playing, you see there, they're playing Benny Hill. I don't even want to do it. Don't want to do it. Again, The King of Limbs was another album adored by most critics, although not as much as their other albums. In February 2012, Radiohead went on their first big North American tour in four years. On June 16th, 2012, just before fans were allowed in a show at Toronto's Downsview Park, the venue's roof collapsed, killing drum technician Scott Johnson oh. and injuring three members of the band's staff. Eventually, what? Radiohead finished out the tour, 
supporting the King of Limbs. And then, another break. In February 2013, Adams for Peace released an album, and in 2014, York and Selway both each released another solo album. Johnny Greenwood scored another soundtrack as well. In September 2014, Radiohead regrouped to record their ninth album. Once again, recording was slow going. In 2016, Radiohead decided it was time to mess with their fans. On April 30th, they sent cards in the mail with lyrics from a new song called Burn the Witch to all fans who had ordered stuff from them in the past. On May 1st, the band deleted all content from their website and social media profiles and replaced them with blank images. Predictably, what? the internet went crazy. On May 3rd, they released a music video for Burn the Witch and made the song available for download. On May 6th, another video for a song called Daydreaming and made it available to download. Pretty clever marketing, I suppose. A moon-shaped pool. Their ninth album dropped on May 8th. And yes, it was critically acclaimed, but by this point, Radiohead could release an album full of crappy songs, and critics probably would still like it. This one had a more <laughs> orchestral feel, mostly thanks to Johnny Greenwood's arrangements. It was haunting, had a slower tempo, and was a bit more low-key. Since then, Radiohead has released a 20th anniversary OK Computer reissue called OK Not OK, which included three okay, previously okay. unreleased tracks. One of those tracks, I promise, is so good you wonder how it never made it on OK Computer. Then you remember that OK Computer was ridiculously good, and it makes sense. It's 2017 now, and Radiohead are bigger than ever, and are already considered to be one of the greatest bands of all time. It began as five teenage boys rehearsing in the music department of a boarding school in Abington. Today, a band that sells out massive arenas, that continues to amaze and inspire, that rarely disappoints, that has five albums on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time Dang, list that al couldn't care less about such a list and that keeps doing its thing whether anyone else is following or not. Hey, shout out to them. Yeah, it, it was it was OK Computer, I remember now. Might have to check that out. Um, again, I'll use this video um, as a... As a way of asking and seeing what the comments say. I know people going to say I should check out this album or that album like from a different artist. I'm just talking about Radiohead. Just Radiohead. Um, but shout out to the Beat Goes On channel. Man, the, the effort they put in these videos to um, get out all this information, man, is incredible. Shout out to them. Make sure you guys are subscribed. They got a lot of videos. But again, I appreciate you guys coming over and watching. It was a lot of stuff I didn't know about them. Now I know. All I really knew was Creep. I think that's the only song I ever reacted to from them. Yeah. All right. Peace out. <laughs>